Up until this weekend, Joe Durant had only won once in 129 PGA Tour events. So he quit at one point. He went to become an insurance salesman. He wasn't very good at that. So he returned to golf. And today he was a very good golfer, winning the Bob Hope Desert Classic. We start with Bob Tway on number 14. Because Bob Tway gets the longest putt of the day. This has got to be at least 35 or 40 feet. Man, look at that thing go. He finished nine shots back in fourth place. And you would say, well, maybe that was the best of the day for Tway. No. Bob Tway on the next hole on number 15. This is his tee shot. Bob Tway looks for a great shot, and he's got it. This is, this is absolutely the almost shot of the day. He comes within three inches of getting a hole in one. He would finish nine shots back in fourth place, but Bob, thanks for the excitement, man. The winner is Joe Durant, who shot the lowest score over 90 holes in history, 36 under par. His second win in 130 PGA Tour events. Joe Durant, congratulations, and welcome back to the world of golf instead of insurance sales. As baseball spring training gets underway, there is one player who is sitting at home and not happy about it. Howard Eskin has the details in this week's edition of Rumorville. Howard. George, baseball spring training just got underway in the last few days, and one player is missing from a major league camp. One that we may not expect to see, but the player wonders why no team has offered him a contract. Outfielder Ricky Henderson, he's 42 years of age, has played in 22 big league seasons with seven different teams, but he thinks there is another motive why no team has signed him. Now, I hear grumblings that Henderson feels it's discrimination, and Henderson is thinking of hiring a prominent attorney to possibly sue baseball. Now, just when you thought it was only Shaquille O'Neal and his teammate Kobe Bryant having trouble getting along in L.A., you can add the head coach, Phil Jackson. Now, let's go back to Wednesday night's game in Philadelphia in the Lakers game against the 76ers. The Lakers lost, but in the process, Phil Jackson was not happy with his star guard pulling Kobe Bryant in the third quarter because it was obvious Kobe didn't bring his A game to the arena. Then Jackson, in a move that coaches use to make a point to their players, put Kobe back in the game during the final six minutes of garbage time. Then after the game came, the real explosion. I'm told there was a major league yelling match in the locker room where Kobe would not back off. It got very ugly. So keep your eyes open for more to come on this one. From Rumorville for the Sports Machine, I'm Howard Eskin. All right, Howard, the Saturn Play of the Week, folks. Salutes the winner of the 125th Westminster Kennel Club. Why? Because this dog, the Bichon, named J.R. from Scarsdale, New York, who was crowned the champion of over 2,500 dogs. Would you look at JR? This dog knows it's a champion. JR, you get our Saturn Play of the Week and you earn every bit of it. Just ahead, we'll look back at the legendary career of NASCAR's Intimidator. Welcome back to the Sports Machine. As I mentioned earlier, I just spent this week in Daytona and had a great visit with Dale Earnhardt. Not many people know that he had recently become a grandfather. He told me that between his new granddaughter and his racing team, that he had never been happier and had never felt more sure that he was going to win his eighth Winston Cup championship. And now this happens. There are very few things I can tell you about Dale Earnhardt that you haven't already heard. But I want to try to show you a side of the Intimidator that I've gotten to know over the last 20 years. Let me take you down to Daytona. Daytona International Speedway, where Dale Earnhardt had some of his best and worst experiences. He had won over 33 races here. He had experienced some of his toughest heartbreaks. He finished second four times in the Daytona 500. In fact, he failed to win the Daytona 500 for the first 19 years of his career. Just a few years ago, he became a sentimental favorite to finally win the race that had broken his heart. A lot of people hadn't won this race, but still, it's the race that I've never won. And as a seven-time champion, that's pretty impressive. It was not to win the Daytona 500, win the most races at Daytona. But, uh, yeah, maybe uh, maybe we will be the, the dark horse or the guy that Everybody pulls forward because he has never won the Daytona 500. 
Dale Earnhardt earned his nickname the Intimidator when he drove the number three Wrangler car. He drew criticism from car number 11, Daryl Waltrip, when those two collided at Richmond in 1986. Dale Earnhardt let nothing stand in the way of victory. The Intimidator took as much as he gave. In 97, the Daytona 500, Dale Earnhardt battling for the lead with 10 laps to go. He's forced into the wall. The impact would cause Earnhardt to flip over into traffic. Amazingly, he was not injured. He would tape up his car with gaffer tape and return to the race. What was your thought when you got flipped at Daytona? Because Dale, hey, I was following it like a hawk. And I could see some things happen. I said, Earnhardt just might get in there and get this thing. Very good race car. And it's the same car I ran down in, in July. We redid the car. But uh, it was just one of them deals. The, you know, the arrow and everybody around you just pushed up off the corner, got into the wall. And Jarrett was behind. He got bumped. I, he bumped me. We turned over. But know. does any thought flash through your mind as you're going over? Nah. It's just, when's this thing going to stop? And we're going to have anything left when it quits. And, Fortunately, we had a little bit left when it quit, and we, we ended up finishing the race anyway. He won 76 races, seven championships in his 23 years of Winston Cup racing. Through his success, he earned the reputation as racing's most intimidating driver. It's a reputation he never backed down from. So I get a letter. Now, this is not make-believe. 56-year-old Ida Maslin from Ada, North Carolina, says, quote, I believe you when you say he is a good person, but I still believe he would run right over me to get to the checkered flag. <laughs> is she right? I am I didn't make this up, so le legit letter. She's probably right. <laughs> <laughs> is, so in other words, my point is, I have to ask you, the fire is still, I would assume, stronger than ever. The will to, to get out there and race and to do the, the job I have to do is, is still there, and the want to win uh, atmosphere is still inside me, and you know, um, it's it's not something that you just run good. I feel good this race. I'm gonna run good. I feel good that I feel that way that all the time. I want to win all of them. I want to go after the number one every time. Not many people realize that off the track, the Intimidator was a softie, especially for the kids of the Make a Wish Foundation. What the fans loved most about Dale Earnhardt was his unyielding desire to win. For him finishing second was never good enough. You're not interested in talking about second. You don't, if you don't win, what's there to talk about? <laughs> but it, it, you're a second place finish in the Daytona 500? <laughs> it's not much to talk about. <laughs> I've never won the Daytona 500. You haven't? Never, ever won the Daytona 500. In February of 1998, 46-year-old Dale Earnhardt had watched John Elway win the Super Bowl with the Broncos. He told me he was so inspired by Elway's performance that he knew this was the year he would win the Daytona 500. In his 20th season, he finally won the Super Bowl of Winston Cup racing. Pretty darn happy, I'm telling you. It's just an awesome feeling. Uh, you know, you think about coming down here 20 years in a row, George. It's, we have won the Daytona 500. It's a feeling that you can't, you can't imagine. It all worked in my favor. Things came down to the wire. We won the race. George, can you believe it? Two months after winning the Daytona 500, Dale would watch his son, Dale Jr., win his first race in the Bush Series. Dad was so overcome with emotion that he had to fight back tears. His son was carrying on the family name in racing. Away from the track, he loved working on his farm. True happiness to Dale was being able to have a fishing rod in his hand. He told me earlier this week that with the birth of his granddaughter, he had more appreciation for life, more appreciation every time he took the track. You appreciate every win you have now, George. It's, I mean, the, everything you accomplish today is so much better because I think one age you, you appreciate it, you enjoy it, you understand it better. But you know how hard and how important it is to all that race team and those people that support you. You will have the greatest party ever if you get the safe title, right? That's what the plan is. We'll go back to partying like we used to. They no. think they party in no. New York. They don't, they don't party in New York. We'll show them how to party. That would be our last conversation. 
Dale Earnhardt is taken from us just two months shy of his 50th birthday on a track that gave him his worst nightmares and his greatest joy. The greatest racing competitor of all time. Despite the fierce competitiveness in NASCAR, this is a family, a family. And we at the Sports Machine want to extend to Dale Earnhardt's family and the entire NASCAR family our deepest sympathy. Good night, everybody.